Next, six. So that's good for that. Number six. Um, data analysis. Data analysis. All right, the first word is a technical term. It's called horizontalization. H-O-R-I-Z-O-N-A-L-I-Z-A-T-I-O-N. Horizontalization. Um, horizontalization is the attempt to understand participant experience, right? Horizontalization, horizon. Um, I remember, well, I'm not going to get into the philosophical account behind this, but anyway. So the attempt to understand participant experience, pretty simple. Um, I'll get back to that. I'll return back to that. Uh, B, uh, cluster of meaning. Should be clusters of meaning. Clusters of meaning, unification of interpretations into themes, right? Clusters of meaning, and I think the next one that we're going to do is, okay. Um, so clusters of, clusters of meaning is an attempt in analyzing my data to get, um, and this, like I said, in, in making the way that I do it, it doesn't have to be that technical, but in separating textual responses from structural responses, grouping all of those responses appropriately, and then identifying key themes in it, what I'm doing is I'm creating clusters of meaning. And then what I do is I go back to those clusters of meaning and see how those meanings conform to or not the phenomenological paradigm, right? Because this is, uh, this is not grammar theory. It's, it's, there is a conformity to the paradigm of phenomenological research, and that paradigm is the lived experience of a participant in an account of uh, understanding the phenomenon. So clusters of meanings sort of unifying the interpretations that uh, multiple participants had and using that theme, those clusters, those sort of solidified points of clarity as um, a launch pad, right, as a starting point to an in-depth analysis. It depends on how deep you're going to do with your analysis, but an in-depth analysis and an in-depth attempt to understand the phenomena itself. It's when we transition, and in the text, your text should actually change the way that it's, it should sound different in, in words. Uh, and I can, you know, I hate when, when qualitative researchers sort of conflate it. Me personally, the way that I like to write this mode is, there's a part of the text where I'm talking about my reactions and my, inter, my interactions with the participant. Then, in the next part, chapter, or whatever, next section, in this order, uh, then I like to... Um, look at the themes that I extracted from my discussions with the participants, but I no longer talk about the participants in this part. Now I'm just looking at the themes that I was able to distill from my discussion with them. Then I move from the themes to the phenomena itself and apply the themes that I got from the participants to an understanding of the phenomena. And in the last phase, all I'm doing is just an analysis of this phenomena via the theme, right? And this is where it becomes meta-analytic, right? All I'm doing now is I've stripped away all embodiment and it's just the concepts and the ideas itself. Um, a lot of people forget that last point, right? You talk about the participants, you talk about the themes, and you sort of wrap up the phenomenological account as a sort of a collection of the themes. It's not wrong to do that, but it's also not thorough to do that. I mean, I'm a philosopher, so, you know, I, we begin with the theme um, and then we move on. Uh, we usually don't even begin with participants, you know. Uh, we just begin with themes and then we move to, to analysis and then we move to meta-analysis. Um, but you should, uh, you should at least strive. You don't have to. But the type of philosophy that I like to read, the type of qualitative research that I like to read ends with, um, ends with some meta-analysis, like an analysis of an analysis of a theme from a participant, if that made any sense. Hopefully it did. Okay, number seven. Unified descriptive account, um, this is pretty simple. What we're doing is, well, actually, I want to, uh, I want to make this clear. So let's say we, we, have z, yeah, we have Z, we have different participants. I don't want to draw a whole bunch of people, so we'll just make it four. One theme, different participants. Um, this person has a description, A. This person has a description, B. This person has a description, C. This person has a description, not A. Whatever. So you, you see that we have four different descriptions. What I want to do is I want to take these, these accounts and I want to say that, you know, first I need to make sure in description A, 
what facet of description A is textual, what facet is structural? What facet is textual, what facet is structural? What facet is textual, what facet is structural? What facet is textual, what facet is structural? Of A. Then, I want to unify, I mean, the way that I do it, right? And it even says so here. Then I want to unify all the textual accounts as sort of one account. And this is a unified, this becomes the unified textual description, right? Unified textual description. Then what I want to do is I want to unify all of my structural responses. Right? And then I have a unified structural description. This unified structural structural description, this unified textual description, is then used, um, is thematized to give me, is thematized, sorry, ah, is thematized to give me a better understanding of the phenomena itself. So from the participants' experience of this phenomena, I'm going to have different descriptive accounts. From those different descriptive accounts, each of those accounts must have a textual and a structural description. You should have textual and structural because the questions that you ask should elicit those responses. Based on those responses, I'm going to unify all of the textual accounts into one thematized textual account. Based on all the descriptive accounts that I have, I'm going to unify all the structural um, descriptive accounts and thematize that into a structural descriptive account. The unified, thematized, structural, and textual descriptive account is the essence, and I use that essence to have a better understanding of the phenomena itself. Okay, so that's that. And then number eight. Number eight. Number eight is the uh, presentation of the uh, invariant structure. Presentation of the invariant structure. Um, this is a combination of the unified textual and structural description, right? Um, the process of unifying the textual and structural description itself is one step removed from the interview questions. Obviously, it's contingent on the interview questions. What I, what I then do is, in unifying that, in unifying all the differences, uh, all the variations in textual or structural descriptions, and unifying it into that um, unified textual or unified structural description, what I'm then doing is that becomes a springboard, right? It becomes a springboard to the, to the understanding of the phenomena. Um, and this is what researchers want, right? They want to find that unified theme, right? It's, that, it's sort of like that passage that sums up the experience um, for the population. You always put disclaimers, and this is not going to be the case that it counts for everybody, but within my research, it accounted for this segment of the population, that, 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 that. When you as a researcher are reading somebody else's research and you get to that point, you're like, oh, that's perfect, right? Um, I can use that, I can use that springboard to have a better understanding of maybe a different aspect, a different facet of, of this analysis, right? A more precise account, right? So that somebody might do an account of um, domestic abuse and somebody might do an account of um, um, domestic abuse uh, of, of men in a relationship, somebody might, you know, the springboards, the unified structural themes and the unified textual themes will allow me to gain um, new modes of, of inquiry. I, you know, that theme describes this particular phenomenon very well, but what it shows me also and what it describes is what it doesn't describe. Why wasn't this point um, discussed? Because that theme doesn't discuss that point. Well, you know what? I want to do analysis that's going to address that point, and so on and so on. And we read each other's stuff, and we pass around our research to, to each other, and the community of research becomes broader and broader and bigger and bigger. But also the community of understanding of a particular phenomenon becomes very, very in-depth. So that when you're talking about things like poverty, our understanding of poverty is very, very complex. We have a very good understanding of poverty. It doesn't mean to say that we understand it completely, but we do understand it because there's been so much qualitative research gone into and done with um, respect to that particular theme. 
um, it's important, as the last point, it's important to then uh, recognize that as, as young academicians, as young researchers, as individuals who are being introduced for the first time to qualitative um, methods of inquiry uh, and qualitative research, the most important thing that I tell my students is not to force a research model onto your interests so that you, you know, wrap up your dissertation or wrap up your thesis. It's what do I find interesting, what is it that I want to say, and find the research model that is best suited to your interests, right? Not the other way around, right? First start with yourself and what is it that I'm interested in, what is the story that I want to tell, how is it that I want to go about collecting data? Present that to your faculty members, or now after having watching, watched all of these segments, and this is only part two of six parts, five parts, of research methods. Um, figure out which research design best suits your uh, research methodology, best suits your interest, and select that. For me, it was uh, a combination. Um, uh, and what I plan on doing um, in this in this new phase of my life is going to be totally different. As a matter of fact, it's a good segue. So with that being said, that concludes the discussion on um, phenomenological research, the two parts of phenomenological research, the two parts of narrative research. So we're done with narrative, we're done with phenomenological. The next that we're going to do um, is going to be participatory action research. I'm going to talk about what participatory action research is, how it is implemented, how it's similar to phenomenological, how it's different from phenomenological. Um, I've done phenomenological, I haven't yet done participatory action research, but that's the next phase of my life. I'm going to spend the next five or so, maybe ten years, maybe not as much as ten, maybe five to eight years doing participatory action research because I love reading it. Um, and I want to do my own because I read Fourier and Fourier says that you have to do your own, otherwise you're an armchair academic and I don't want to be that guy. So um, I, with the, all of that being said, uh, participatory action research is the next on the agenda the third of the qualitative research methods, the first being narrative, then phenomenological. Now we're going to do participatory action research. Um, most of the discourse on participatory action research, I just really happen to like the analysis in this book, is going to be uh, Alice McIntyre's uh, uh, account of participatory action research. Um, and this also is a SAGE. SAGE does some good publications on qualitative. I don't have to think about SAGE. Um, it's also a SAGE text. So uh, with that being said, Thanks for taking the time to watch um, this account of phenomenological research. I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell. Have a good day.